My name is Clem. I grew up in a little town in South Louisiana called uh, Chicopin, about an hour west of New Orleans and right in the end of the deep bayou. There are channels everywhere and you can make it from my backyard all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico by boat. We spent some time on the water just about every day since I can remember. We knew the waterways in Terrebonne Parish like the backs of our hands. Me and my cousin Rake, we were about the same age. We were partnered up a lot when we were kids. There were times when we'd spend most of our days in the bayou, hunting, fishing, and trapping. And that's what life was like. For the longest time, that's about all it was. But there was one particular day, night, I should say. It stands out above all the rest, though. A night I still had bad dreams about all these years later. It happened when we were about 12. Me and Rake. So we'd gone out in the bayou late in the evening to run some traps. Daddy and Uncle Billy pretty much let us do whatever we wanted because they knew they could trust us. They knew we knew our way around. And they knew we could handle ourselves. We were also supposed to stay inside certain boundaries. To the south, that meant staying out of the ship channel and not porging over any land barriers that would let us get too far from home. We usually minded those boundaries, but, well, sometimes we didn't. The night I'm talking about was one of those nights when we decided to take some liberties. There was a series of traps we'd set along a part of the bayou we couldn't get in our little aluminum boat unless we either skirted along the edge of the ship channel for a ways or else portaged across a small stretch of land around a hundred yards or so. Once we'd paddled out the ship channel and saw that it was clear, well, we decided to take our chances. The wake from even a small ship could swamp us if it passed too close, but we could see far enough both ways to feel comfortable. Besides, portaging along was always a pain, especially in the dark. We made it about halfway to the channel we were heading to when things took a turn. I was in the back of our boat, so I saw it first. A small freighter coming up from behind us. I got Rake's attention and pointed out to the ship. We both knew what to do without further discussion. Dug in deep, paddled as hard as we could. Still, I yelled at Rake to paddle harder as the ship drew near. I could see the edge of the channel we were headed to as the ship's bow pulled even closer with us. To tell the truth, I half expected to get wet. But we turned into our little channel just as the ship's wake reached us. We rode on top the wave for a ways until it died down. And then we laughed. And we thanked our lucky stars. Semi-disaster avoided. It was a pretty clear night. There was a full moon over us with only the occasional cloud, so we could see well enough to navigate, even without our flashlights. There were cypress trees all about, and the Spanish moss hung thick all around, giving the trees a ghostly air. I love that about the bayou. It always gave me a sense that I was a part of something that wasn't quite squared away. The first trap we came to didn't have nothing, so we moved towards the next one. And it was around a bend in the little peninsula that was just barely higher than the water. And as we paddled nearer and rake shined the light, we both saw it. Two bright eyes shining back at us. And from the looks of them, they belonged to something large. You could always feel in your heart. You could always feel your heart rate get up when you caught something, especially if it was bigger than a coon or a possum. I could tell this was... This was bigger. Now, we were eager to get there, but because we were seasoned trappers, we knew to take our time. Steady strokes. Do nothing to get the animal more excited or scared than it already was. We must have still been about 40 or so feet away when Rake stopped paddling, though. I stopped too. We kept drifting slowly toward the bank. And I shined my light at the trap and finally saw what we'd already seen. It, it, it wasn't a, a normal animal there in the bank. At least, not one we'd expect to catch. It, it was a gator. Well, not just any gator. But maybe the biggest gator I'd ever seen. It, it had to have been 16, 18 feet long. 1,500 pounds, if it was a pound at all. It also wasn't caught in our trap. It was just sitting there on the bank, looking right at us, sort of grinning, like, like he was inviting us on up. You know, come on, boys, I got room. Rake had done the right thing by not making any sudden movements, but my body didn't seem inclined to follow suit. I began paddling backwards as hard as I could, and in no time flat, I'd stopped our forward progress, 
and started us back in the way we came. By then, there was no point in Rake staying still, so we started paddling as well. He turned us around so our bow was in front and we stayed at it, and by then, the gator had slithered into the water and disappeared beneath the surface. You talk about your heart rate going up. My heart was rattling in my chest, like that playing card that I'd stuck in my bike spokes. Even though it wasn't common for a gator to chase after a boat, we kept going until my arms burned like they were about to fall off. Then we both stopped paddling and we looked, we looked behind us. Rake stood up in the front of the boat so that he could shine his light at the water back towards the peninsula without me blocking it. I saw several water moccasins swimming towards the light as they were prone to do, but I didn't see no gator. It occurred to me though that the light was likely to attract a gator as it was a snake. So I yelled at Rake to put the light out. He did, but it was too late. Just as he switched it off, I saw it rise up. The top side of the gator's massive head, not more than five feet behind us. His big eyes focused right on me. I could see the water rippling too, way back behind where his tail was swimming slow. At good lord, he was big. Rake saw him too, but I yelled at him anyway. I was already paddling before his butt hit the seat, and we both started digging at the water as hard as we could. It wasn't but a few seconds later, though, that something bumped up against the side. So hard it almost tipped us over. Rake lost hold of his paddle and it went into the water, but I didn't care. Once the boat had settled, I kept paddling. We had a 22 caliber rifle and a 22 caliber pistol in the boat with us. I didn't figure either one of them would do good against the gator hide, but since Rake had lost his paddle, he grabbed up the pistol. The gator pushed up against the side of our boat again, but not as solid as before. It didn't cause me to break stride. There was another bump. Then a while later, it felt like the gator tried to come up from under the boat, sort of lifted us up on the water and then it went away. I paddled for just about as long as I could and then I stopped. I could see the ship coming from where we were. I told Rake I didn't think it was wise for us to go out in the ship channel, especially since we didn't have what one paddle. Now, of course, we could come across something unpleasant on land if we chose to portage, but as long as we had our guns, we should be able to manage. So that's what we decided to do. In any event, we didn't need to sit where we were for very long. That gator could have gotten bored and moved on. We couldn't be sure of that. We needed to move. Rake shined his light over the left bank, and pretty soon he found the spot we usually used as a landing. I started moving us in that direction, but no sooner than I got us turned that way, Rake yelled at me to look out, and he fired several shots right past my shoulder. I turned just in time to see the huge gator coming at me his whole head out of the water with his jaw wide and just about to come over the stern. I remember thinking that in a split second, how big his teeth were, but they were huge. Anyway, I launched myself forward towards Rake just as the animal landed its head where I'd been sitting and all at once the boat pinched up hard and rolled. Me and Rake landed in the bayou. The water was so deep enough to be over our heads as close to the ship channel and I was disoriented at first, having gone under in all that blackness. And of course, it didn't help that I was completely panicked. But soon enough, I remember to stay still and look for light, and I saw some, some pretty quick moonbeams on the surface. Now, I swam up to the top. The boat was upside down, but it was just a few feet away from me. I got hold of it at the same time the rake did. I sure was glad to see him there, but I was just as aware that we truly were in mortal danger, and I had to get going. Rake said it too. We had to get on land. We had to get to the bank. I said that we should stay on the boat, and we did. Him on one side, me on the other, paddling towards the shore, and we had just reached the point where our feet could touch bottom when I felt something brush up against my leg, something heavy and rough. No doubt it was a gator, but its body scraped up on my thigh all the way from its front legs to its back. I was so scared, I felt like my soul was about to shoot out from my body, and I couldn't help but freeze. I stood perfectly still. Rake asked me what was wrong, but before I could answer, the gator took hold of him and yanked him under. I know it's not manly at all, but I screamed. I called his name over and over, but I couldn't see him anywhere. Him or the gator for that matter, no sign at all. I wasn't really, really thinking clear by then neither, but I managed to turn the boat back over, climb in, and as fate would have it, the only thing left in our boat was my paddle. No guns, no flashlight, no nothing but my paddle. It had got jammed up under the seat somehow when the gator had come crashing down on it. And needless to say, maybe, but by then I'd become hysterical. I mean, I didn't... It didn't seem real. I mean, how was it possible that my cousin was out there somewhere under the water in the jaws of a, of a huge gator? 
It was too awful to consider, yet... Yet that seemed to be the story. That was what there was. That was all there was. Gators didn't eat you right away, neither. They took you under in a death roll, and you were drowned, and then they stuffed you under a ledge or a log or something and left you there to rot. And once you're ready, they come back for you, and they eat you piece by piece. For all the world and everyone in it. How could that be my cousin Rick's destiny? To rot under a log, then be ate up by a huge gator. There was nothing, though. No sound but the occasional hooting of an owl and the croak of a bullfrog, and I thought I heard a big cat growl. But other than that, the bayou was quiet. Then all of a sudden, not far from me, there came a big splash and a fuss about the surface of water. I saw Rake. He was trying to swim away from the gator, but the gator was practically on top of him. And only a second or so later, they both went under. Now, this was horrible. The most horrible thing I could imagine, and I was living it. I paddled over to where they had gone down, but there was nothing to be seen. A few seconds later, though, they came up and more towards the middle. I yelled out his name. He managed to look my way for a split second, and then he yelled my name. Then the gator took him under again. I don't know how I knew, but it was clear to me right then and there that hearing him call my name like that and seeing that gator take him under would haunt me for the rest of my days. I started towards where they'd been, but then they came up again, more towards the bank. This time, not only did he call my name, but he also screamed the word help. And scream it, he did, like, like nothing I'd ever heard. The sound of his voice was the embodiment of terror, and we, and hearing it, my skin crawled all over. Then, like before, they disappeared beneath the water, and the last thing I saw was Rake's hand, clawing at the air, trying to find anything to grab hold of. I desperately paddled towards him. I started looking, hollering for him, bending over the side of the boat so far to see under the water that I almost fell out. Too long. You've been under too long this time. There's no way he could still be alive. I, I came to know that in my heart and a feeling of evil and darkness like I'd never imagined possible began to settle over me. This was more than I could bear. I, I didn't see how I could ever find my way to any form of sanity. I could feel it in my whole body like a weight, like a poison. I could barely breathe. Suddenly, without any warning at all, something came crashing to the surface of the water, right beside my boat like it had been shot out of a cannon. Miracle of miracles, it was rake. And he was most of the way on the boat before I could even get over and help drag the rest of him the way in. He flopped to the boat's bottom like a big fish, and before I could fully grasp the reality of what had just happened, he screamed at me to paddle and get to the land. He wouldn't shut up about it, and finally, I made my way to the seat and started paddling for shore. Rake was breathing hard and moaning just about every other breath, but I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tend to him just then. I had to get us to shore. I was afraid to look over my shoulder to see if we were being followed, but finally I couldn't help it. Sure enough, there it was. That big gator was right behind us, no more than three feet back, just skimming along with nothing showing but the top of his head and back, with his tail squishing back and forth real slow. Just a few seconds later, I ran the boat aground. I hopped over Rake and out the front so I could drag it all the way up, and once I'd done it, I looked over, fully expecting to see the gator coming up after us. But to my surprise, I didn't see him nowhere. I didn't quite trust it. I, I mean, I... It could have popped out of the water at any moment. But the relief I felt that instant was indescribable. And anyway, whether the gator was coming after us or not, I had to get farther from the water. So I dragged the boat a good 20 yards on land. And only then did I dare give Rake a good look. What I saw was ghoulish. He had blood on a lot of places, but the thing... The thing that got me the most was his leg. His right leg. From the knee all the way down to his foot, there was... There was nothing but bone. No skin, no meat, just bone. A little bone in back was just hanging loose. 
And I could see where the big bone was almost broken too. The thing I found most odd though was that his shoe was still on his foot. His leg had gone through all that and somehow his shoe had managed to stay on his foot. Anyway, I tried to talk to him, but he wasn't making no sense. I could see that his leg was bleeding bad from just below his knee. And I knew that he was bound to bleed to death. I couldn't find a way to stop it or at least slow it down. Frankly, I didn't know how to manage the presence in my mind, but somehow right then I knew what I had to do. I took off my belt, I wrapped around his thigh right above the knee, and I pulled it tight, tight as I could. Then I wrapped it around again and tied it off. I could see the bleeding slow. Seemed like by a lot. And no sooner than I got the belt cinched in place, though, I heard the low growl of a big cat, maybe the one I heard when I, when I was still out there in the water somewhere, real close. Maybe he'd been watching, stalking us, waiting to see if we'd managed to escape the gate or make it to dry land. And by the time, no doubt, smelled all the blood that was wetting its appetite, I had to admit that my imagination was fear-fueled, overdrive, but that wasn't a doubt in my mind that there was a panther nearby and that it was going to come after us. I couldn't just sit there, wait for it to attack though, so I hopped out of the boat and I started dragging it. This wasn't easy by myself in the dark, with Rake lying up towards the front end. I almost tripped several times over roots and such, but I managed to keep my balance and keep going. I could hear it though, I, I could hear the big cat pacing us, probably waiting for the right moment, and I stopped to listen, and it stopped. It started back up and it came along, it was crazy, I felt, I felt completely vulnerable, yet I was unable to do anything about it. If only our guns weren't at the bottom of the bayou. I made it about three quarters of the way across and I had to stop to rest just for a minute. But I had to stop. And that's when it happened. A panther came at me in the flesh. Knocked me back into the boat. Came down on top of Rake. Panther came down on top of me. I knew in my heart that we'd come to an end because there was a full grown cat on me. And I was just a boy all alone without any means of protecting myself. The moment was near, I could he I could feel it. And just when my will to live was about to succumb to the panther's desire to eat, though, I heard it. It was a shot coming from nearby, and in that instant, the big cat went limp, fell lifeless on top of me. I scrambled out from under it, managed to find my feet in a hurry. What a strange memory. The, the sight of seeing Rake and the panther lying side by side in the bottom of that boat, one barely alive, the other one dead as a stone. It seemed like a dream, even then, but I knew it wasn't. You know, just then, I, I felt a hand on my shoulder. It was my daddy. And I can say with complete confidence that I'd never been so glad to see somebody in all my life before or since. Him and Uncle Billy and two of their friends had come looking for us when we hadn't made it back for supper, and luckily for us, they had. I told them what had happened real quick and just as quick. Daddy and Uncle Billy carried us to their boat, took us back to the house so they could get Rake to the hospital. My friends stayed back. They had a gator to hunt and kill. Rake lost his leg below the knee. But he kept his life. I still don't understand how he managed to get away from that big gator, but he had. I can't even imagine what those few minutes must have been like for him. You know, fighting against that beast under the dark water. Unlike me and the panther, I've always thought that Maybe his will to live had been stronger than the gator's desire to eat. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. All I know for sure is that all these years later, I still travel all over those bayou channels. So does Rake. And just like when we were kids, sometimes we follow the rules. And sometimes we don't. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's podcast. You can find Mr. Creepypasta Storytime on any kind of podcasting platform if you're watching on YouTube, and if you're listening to the podcast already, you can find Mr. Creepypasta on YouTube. <laughs> A huge thank you to all you guys who show support by subscribing to the channel or following the podcast and coming back episode by episode. I really appreciate that, and I really want to tell you all thank you for what you've done. If you always want to find more from me, you can on Instagram at Billy the Skeleton. That's me, Billy the Skeleton, all one word. That's the only Mr. Creepypasta account there. And on Twitter at Mr. Creepypasta, then the number zero. 
I'm also on Patreon. You can find a whole bunch of other people supporting on Patreon in the description down below, but there is a very, very special thank you to these people in particular. Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Creepypasta Adam, Ken Lando Higuchi, Mazakin, Champinsky, The Red Oak Shield Virus, G Weevil 3, Diana Krauss, Steven Van Huss, Chance Burton, Tristan Pelton, Nico Cow, The Ginger Bros, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, Steampunk Sinner, Caleb Dougal, Sky Harbor, The Homeless Bird 93, Bobby Carmen, Liam Newman, Aaron Stormcrow, Barbara Maceo, Thomas Burgett, Azazel Rotten, S-Man, Kirisuba, Bad Honey, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Somber Puppet, Wolfie Numbs, Shadow Morningstar, Sean Mills, Jesse Gonzalez, Mad Marstomp, Z Kearley, Cassie Core, Mr. Thud, and Patrick Schoolmeister. These guys are the real MVPs, and all of you who are listening are also the real MVPs. Stay safe, everyone, and sweet dreams.